Well, welcome once again, Agape class, to our series that we've called to consider and praise. It's our journey through the Psalms, and today we're going to be jumping in to Psalm chapter 6. This has really been an exciting series for me, even as we're doing things very differently, pre-recording the lessons and then discussing the lessons with a few folks on Mondays at 7 p.m. with our Zoom discussion. If you would like to join us on our Zoom discussion Monday at 7 o'clock, please email me Zach, Z-A-C, at fpclakeland.org, and I'll give you all the meeting information uh, so that you can join us. Uh, it has been great discussions. Those, those times go by really, really quickly, uh, but uh, they're very edifying for me. Today, in Psalm chapter 6, we're going to be reading a different type of psalm than one that we have read thus far. And like we do every week, we're going to try to read this slowly and devotionally and ask how God means this to impact our hearts and our minds. So let's read together from Psalm chapter 6. To the choir master, with stringed instruments, according to the Shemineth, a psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It groans, weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be turned and be ashamed. And greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Right now, take a, a few moments and, and think about this psalm in light of our previous psalms. How would you characterize this prayer, this psalm? When might you pray this in your own life? Take a few moments and reflect on what God is speaking to you as you read and meditate on this Word of God. Well, this is a very different psalm than the previous five that we've read together. And while it's difficult to tell from the internal evidence at what point this psalm may have been composed in the life of David or its writer, uh, indeed, there are, there are actually some scholars that feel that this psalm fits more into the motif of Israel as they're in exile, waiting to be restored, or, or maybe in the life of Jeremiah. But, but whatever the case may be, we can tell from the outset that this psalm was, like all the psalms, used liturgically by God's people. It's directed to the choir master, according to the Shemineth. And, and we don't really know what the Shemineth means. Again, like the word Sheol or, or some of the other terms that we, we read in the Psalms, it could be a liturgical uh, uh, term. It could be a musical term. It could set the tone of the Psalm. But we know that it was used by God's people for the sake of worship. In fact, it's continued to be used for a very specific time in the life of God's people. By the 6th century, the the Christian church had adopted this as one of the the seven psalms of repentance, uh, along with Psalm 32 or Psalm 38 or Psalm 51 or Psalm 102 or 130 or 143. These were psalms that were directed at hearts repentant for their sins. Often, these psalms, including Psalm 6, were used in Ash Wednesday services as worshipers contemplated their own sin and guilt. 
One of the reasons I'm standing here in the chapel at First Presbyterian Church in Lakeland is because this is where we host a lot of our Ash Wednesday services. At the very end of this aisle, I have imposed the ashes, the sign of the cross on people's foreheads as they are declared to be dust and returning to dust. The interesting thing about this psalm, though, unlike Psalm 51, for example, another psalm of repentance, is there's no direct admission of sin. Rather, there is reference to the troubling in the soul, and that has the greatest connection to people in their problem of individual sin. When David begins this prayer in verses 1 through 3, there is another cry for mercy, a cry for mercy that we've heard in other psalms. But this time, David addresses the personal name of Yahweh. In fact, the entire psalm is addressed to Yahweh. In in our translations, that, that word, that name is translated Lord, but it's the personal name of God, and that opens his request for mercy. He's asked, to be spared the rebuke and discipline that he is now experiencing. Elsewhere in the scriptures, in the Old Testament specifically, the rebuke of God, the discipline of God, is most closely associated with God's loving kindness. If we look, example, for uh, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, the Proverbs writer says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father, the son in whom he delights. Discipline is part of the loving kindness of God. But David attributes his situation to the wrath and the anger of God. You know, oftentimes the wrath and the anger of God and the love of God, they seem entirely incompatible. You know, our modern sensibilities, they tempt us to think that if you're angry with someone, you can't love them. Or, 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 or if, you, if you have this passionate kind of response to one of their actions, that means you don't love them. Indeed, some commentators go out of their way to interpret this passage as saying that God merely appears to be angry, but that the loving kindness of God is the real source of discipline. Others believe the writer of this psalm can't see anything instructive in his current state of mind. And so what he's experiencing must emanate from God's anger and that alone. But if you're a parent, like I am, you know the reasons that you get so upset with your children. I know when my kids uh, disobey me, when when they do something wrong, I get angry. And it's not because I I have something other than love in my heart for them. In fact, my anger, my passionate response to their disobedience or their, their wrongdoing is because I love them. I want what's best for them. And if they disobey and and their disobedience puts them in a dangerous or precarious situation, then the loving response is to be angry and to discipline them. Now, If someone else's child disobeys their parent and I see that, or if another child does something wrong and I see that, I might be concerned, I might be disappointed, but my reaction is not nearly as passionate for other people's children as it is for my own, for the simple reason that I don't have that same relationship with them as I do with my own kids. For David, his situation is dire. It's so dire that he says his bones, his very soul, is trembling. It's shaking. The Hebrew actually puts it literally to say that he palpitates with his trouble. His whole being is affected. And yet, he affirms that this experience is, on some level, an experience of God. With God's ordaining purpose behind it. So he can only ask the question, how long, O Lord? How long must I endure this situation? In in, in Psalm 90, verses 13 through 14, the writer uses a formula formula that's very similar to that of Psalm 6. 
There in verse 13, the, the writer says, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. See, God, see, David uh, addresses the Lord. He addresses Yahweh and asks him to turn and repent. Not because God is sinning, but to turn from his current course of action in David's life, to save him. And, and he makes that appeal on the basis of God's steadfast love, his hesed, his covenant-based love for his people. We talked at length about the steadfast love of God as that, that theme was introduced in Psalm chapter 5. The prayer here in Psalm 6 has echoes of one made by Moses in Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, it's one of the most infamous scenes in the life of God's people, the Israelites. They have been led by God out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. They have been led uh, through the Red Sea and watched as, as Egypt, their foes, are defeated at the hands of God. God gives them instructions and laws to keep. And as Moses is up on the mountain, they get bored. Moses is gone for 40 days and, and they say, where is this Moses? We don't know what's happened to him. And so they address Aaron and say, Aaron, give us gods that we might worship them. And so they give Aaron all their gold pieces, the gold, the very gold that God has provided for them out of Egypt. They throw it into a fire and then they fashion a golden calf to be their God. Moses comes down the mountain and sees what's happened and he smashes the, the Ten Commandments and he goes back up the mountain to speak to the Lord and the Lord is ready to totally and completely annihilate the people and start all over again with Moses. But in Exodus 32 verse 12, Moses intercedes with the prayer. He says, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he, that's the Lord, bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn, Moses asks. Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars in the heaven. And all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. Moses addresses the Lord and asks him to turn. And then he calls on the special relationship that God has with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the rationale to turn. In verse 5 of, of Psalm chapter 6, uh, David, in, in addressing God he, he, in this prayer for mercy, he looks to the extreme possibility that this moment might actually lead to his death. And indeed, what good would it be, he asks, if he were dead? You know, there's been a debate amongst scholars if the Jewish people really had a concept of the life after death. I believe they did. But what David is doing is saying, look, God, you are the giver of life. And in this life, God, the life that you've given me, I can still praise you. I can still worship you. But in the grave, what good am I to the earth to praise you? He can't praise in the same way in the grave. And so he calls on the Lord to be merciful. And then in verse 6 and 7, it's almost an aside, but it's actually the centerpiece of the psalm. This is what it says. David writes, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. The centerpiece of this psalm focuses on the physical, mental, and emotional toll that David's situation is taking on him. This is where the rawness of the psalm really hits home. He's not only weary from the situation he's in, but he's actually weary from his grief, the grief of the situation. He's been crying and crying and physically, literally crying, but figuratively he's done so to such an extreme that he actually says his bed is flooded with tears. 
the bed, the place where we sleep and find rest. And the theme of sleep and rest has been part of previous psalms that we've covered. Psalm 3 and Psalm 4, they talk about sleep and rest that God can give them, that, that sleep of peace that can only come from taking refuge in God. But here, it's only grief. It's only a place of sorrow. Verses 6 and 7, there are a couple of Hebrew words that are really, really unique. And, and the first word is the word rendered flood, saha. And, and the basic meaning is to swim or to actually drown in. The other word, uh, that, that, that's kind of unique is the word that's translated in the English Standard Version as wastes away or grow weak. This word is only used three times in the Bible and only used in the book of Psalms. It, it, it describes the weakness of the eyes that David experiences here. His weakness is not the result of old age or overuse or natural degradation. It's because of the trauma that he's experiencing, the mourning. If you take those two Hebrew words together in their uniqueness, you get get the, 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 the extreme nature of grief that David is facing. This is the weight that he's feeling, and, I, and I'm sure that you can relate to that. I mean, moments of loss in your life where you've lost a loved one, lost a relationship, you've lost a job, you're in financial insecurity, and you just are crushed under the weight of that grief. It's not just emotional. You feel it physically. David prays to to his God out of that situation. And that's what makes makes verses 8 through 10 so such a stark contrast. Because in verses 8 through 10, we, we get a declaration of victory and relief as David addresses all those who would work evil in his life. Listen to this. He says, depart from me, all you workers of evil. Why can he say that? He says, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be turned to shame and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. In verse 2, the psalmist has cried out for mercy, and here he's been heard. There's this this wonderful repetition where David uses the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Yahweh has heard. Yahweh has heard. He says twice. And then in the the first part of verse 9, or the second part of verse 9, he says, Yahweh has accepted. He's been heard, and the prayer has been accepted. And so David has confidence in these verses. And it's no way indicative that his situation has changed. There's nothing that tells us in the psalm that verse 8 means that his situation has changed. In in fact, his situation doesn't seem to have changed at all. He trusts God regardless of the circumstances. He trusts that God will deliver him such that evildoers... Those like, like them that are described in preceding psalms, those that are full of arrogance and self-sufficient stupidity as in Psalm 2, those who believe there's no salvation in the Lord as in Psalm 3, those that have mocked the anointed for trusting in the Lord, David can say, depart, get out of here, because I know my God has heard me, and I know my God accepts me, even though... The circumstances seek to break me. Their continued mockery of God will ultimately be turned to shame. But David is certain of his own restoration. You know, as we mentioned at the outset of this psalm, this discussion, uh, this prayer, Psalm 6, was used by the early church as a prayer of penitence. At Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday, those types of services, they remind us of our own frailty. They remind us of our own failures. They remind us of our sins, and they remind us of the brokenness of this world and our physical limitations. During the Ash Wednesday service, we put ashes on the forehead of the worshiper. And as we do so, we say the words, the traditional words are, 
from dust you came, and to dust you will return. It's kind of a stark reminder of the brokenness in this world and the wasting away of our own bodies. We're all going to endure that. We're all going to feel that at some point. But at the same time, the ashes are placed on the forehead in the sign of a cross. See, the cross reminds us that the weight of all of our brokenness, the weight of all of our disease, the weight of all of our sin, the weight of all of our shame has been taken to the cross of Jesus on our behalf. So we can read Psalm 6 and know that the Lord does hear us and, and know that the Lord does accept our prayers because God understands as the writer of Hebrew puts it, when he talks about Jesus as our great high priest, in Hebrews 4.15 he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We know that the Lord hears us and accepts our prayers because he himself endured hardship for our sake. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, so that you and I might know that, yes, in, in, in this life there are going to be circumstances that are troubling, circumstances that weigh us down, circumstances that cause us to flood our bed with tears, but that's not the end of the story because of the cross and the empty tomb. It's true that we all have trouble and pain and hurt and frustration in this world. But Jesus reminds us in John 16, take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you that even in our darkest, most painful moments, you hear us and you care. Because of your steadfast love, Lord, continue to hear our cries for mercy and let us know with confidence that you accept them. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can have a joy even in the middle of hardship. We can have a peace in the middle of discomfort. Lord God, remind us of your Holy Spirit. Remind us of what you took to the cross in Jesus Christ because of your steadfast love. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, everybody, and we will see you again next time.